church today. Why don't we stand and let's just sing uh, that song, Word of God Speak, before we get into the Word of God. Amen. Word of God Speak, would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God speaks, would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God speak. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you today, God. We thank you, Lord, for your presence, Lord, that has been near to us as we've been praying and seeking your face and bringing our requests before you. We thank you, Lord, that you have heard us, each and every one, Lord, and that you are here, Lord, with us right now, Jesus. Lord, speak to us, Lord, as we go into your word, Jesus. Open our eyes, O oh God, to the things in your word today, Jesus. Let your presence continue to linger here with us. Lord, and touch our hearts, stir our hearts, oh God, as we look at what you have said to us today. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, we will turn to Mark, not Mark, John. John chapter 11. You can be seated. Not chapter 11 either, chapter 12. <laughs> Uh, well, we can go to Mark 11 if you want. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head what that's about, but uh, no, John chapter 12. Oh, praise God. All right. Um, Brother Dylan, let's start with you. If you can read verses 1 to 3 for us, please. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. And they made them a supper, and Martha served. Elijah was one of them that, that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spike, now very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. All right, so there's a time marker here, six days before the Passover. And as we are about halfway through the book of John, we've covered over three years of Jesus' life, and the last half is all about the, the, the last week of his life. And so we find here, of course, last week we talked about, as Brother Dylan taught us, about Lazarus being raised from the dead. And so this, on this occasion, we find Jesus back in Bethany, uh, back with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And Martha is doing what she usually is doing when we find her. She's serving. Uh, Martha had a gift for hospitality. It sometimes got her in trouble, but uh, we find her, you know, I can imagine she's putting on a grand banquet. Of course, this time, the cause for celebration, not just Jesus' visit, but Lazarus being raised from the dead. Now, we have birthday parties, and, you, you know, they can be simple or they can be quite elaborate. We have weddings and all those types of celebrations, but uh, I can imagine the celebration when somebody's been raised from the dead. That's a, that'd be quite a party, I would think to celebrate that. So Martha is serving true to her character and true to Mary's character. We find her doing what she likes to do best as well, and that is sitting at the feet of Jesus. She's worshiping at the feet of Jesus. And it's not unusual when you have somebody over in that time and culture, it was not unusual to wash their feet and even anoint their head. Now, usually the washing of the feet, that would be the slave's job, but not everybody had slaves or servants as well, so sometimes they just did it themselves as a way to honor. But anoint, the anointment usually went on the head. You wash the feet with water, you put the, the, the anointing on the head. To anoint the feet instead of the head was, was out of the ordinary. And so we see here 
uh, humility in her worship, where she's, she's bowed down, she's in a posture of humility, she's at the feet of Jesus, she's, mm -hmm. she's anointing them, she's, she's covering them. And that leads us to the next point, is that her worship was an investment. She used a whole pound of spike, spikenard, which was a precious ointment. And we'll see later what Judas estimates this at. He estimates it at 300 denarii, which is a year's worth of wages for uh, an average working man. So she probably, what is her life savings, or at least a significant uh, amount of savings, a very significant amount, she uses it to anoint his feet. Even though that was such a, a, a big value, an expensive item, she only seemed to consider it good enough for his feet. Her worship was humble, it was, it was giving, it was sacrificial. And the other thing that we know about this is she used her hair to wipe his feet. Now this is significant because for a Jewish woman to unbind her hair is considered somewhat scandalous. Maybe not all the way out there, but it is kind of borderline. It's usually if you were letting down your hair in public, it, there would be some questions about maybe your morals because culturally that was just not done. Mm -hmm. And so we find that in this moment of worship, she undoes, dun, undoes, untie my tongue and try again, undoes her hair and uses it to wipe his feet. If you look at it and you look at what a woman's uncut hair represents in the Bible, and I'm not going into that today, but it represents submission and glory. The Bible says that the woman's hair is given to her for a covering and it describes it as her glory. She literally laid her glory at his feet. Her worship was, was unashamed. It wasn't, she wasn't worried about, you know, okay, are they going to judge me for doing this? She wasn't thinking through all those things first. Or if she did think about them, they were quickly moved out of the way. It was just, how can I honor Jesus? And John recalls here the smell, and smell is often associated with memories. And he recalls to mind that as she did this, as she anointed his feet and worshipped and wiped his feet with her hair, that the whole house was filled with the smell, the fragrance of this oil that she was using. And in this little passage, in this little story of Mary, we find such a good example of what worship looks like. Because worship that is humble, worship that is sacrificial, worship that's not worried about what everybody else might be thinking about it and just laying everything at his feet mm -hmm. is a beautiful smell to the Lord. It's a, a sweet smelling savor that goes up before him. And it has a tendency to spread. It changes the atmosphere in the same way that you know, that, that fragrance would spread. It, it mm -hmm. spreads through the atmosphere around you. That's why sometimes, in a, well, it doesn't have to be a service, but when we get together, and one person, it just takes one person that begins to worship, really worship, and that will, that, will, that will spread, and that will change the atmosphere, and others will get on board. But it starts with just somebody making that determination that they're going to just shut everything else out and just give it all to the Lord. And we see a beautiful example of that with Mary. But let's go on to verses 4 through 7, Sister Monroe. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, what, why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then, Jesus, then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying, have she kept this. Oh, sorry, verse 8 as well. Sorry. For the poor always ye have with you, but me you have not always. So, it doesn't say it in scripture, so this is just me. But I imagine somewhat of an awkward silence. <laughs> while this is going on, you know, or at least when she was done. I'm sure there was some chatter around the table, but then this 
this thing that Mary is doing, as be people begin to notice that she's knelt there and anointing his feet and then taking out her hair, I can imagine it just kind of falling a little bit silent, like, uh, okay, what's, what's going on here? You know, what's, what's Jesus going to say to this? <laughs> kind of, uh, I, just, I just kind of imagine that happening. But then Judas speaks up. Judas is scared, of course, we know his name. We know what he's going to do in just a, a chapter or two. But the other Gospels do not name Judas by name, but say that the disciples expressed this sentiment. So I wonder if Judas maybe just expressed some of what the others were thinking. And then as he said it, it kind of gave them the boldness to be like, yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point. You know, why wasn't well, this, this, we could have put this to better use. Because we see this, this attitude of such extravagant worship as a waste. Surely we could have found, and I preached on this not too long ago, so I won't go too far into it, but surely we could have found a better use for such a large investment. Isn't this just a little bit too much? Of course, we know that Judas had some ulterior motives. He saw the worship as wasteful, and even his criticism, it sounded good on the surface. It sounds good, right? We could sell this. We could give it to the poor. Surely that's a noble cause. But we know that his motives underlying were selfish. The wealthy, There's several wealthy women that supported Jesus with their finances and, and were kind of like patrons, if you can say it that way, of Jesus. And Judas was the treasurer. He carried the money bag, but there's kind of a play on words with the carried. He carried the money bag, but he also carried off the money bag. There's actually a, quite a play on words there in the Greek. And so we see out of his hypocritical motives making this criticism of what a waste she's given. But Jesus stands up for, he defends, and he even praises what Mary has done. The poor, they, they were, they're always going to be around until Jesus comes back and we have a new heaven and a new earth. There's always going to be the poor. And so there's always that opportunity to give. Jesus was not saying don't give to the poor. Don't help them out. Don't support them. He's saying you're always going to have that opportunity to do that. But Jesus was soon gone. And since Mary had sat at Jesus' feet and listened to his teachings, maybe she had actually caught some more than the rest of them had. Maybe she understood that. Um, maybe maybe she didn't. She was just feeling led of the Spirit. If, well, not, you know, that sort of thing. But perhaps she understood his coming and suffering and death. But he made it clear that it was for his burial. Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, is not mentioned as one of the women that came and anointed, anointed Jesus' body after the burial. There's several other Marys mentioned, but she's not one of them. She had already done it. It's like bringing flowers to the person before they die instead of at the funeral. You know, while they, while they can enjoy it, while they can... So, the moral of the story is, we must strive to be a Mary and not a Judas. Let's determine that we're going to be the one giving our all and worshiping at the feet of Jesus, not the one that's observing and saying, well, surely that's, that's a bit, bit too much. We must be careful to have Mary's attitude and not Judas's. Verses 9 through 11, for the coffin. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake uh, only, but that, but that they might also see Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So not only did they strive to kill Jesus, the religious leaders, we've heard a lot about that, we know a lot about their uh, conflicts and, and their seeking to kill him, but not only him, but also Lazarus too. Because I think Dylan mentioned it last week, the, the raising of the dead was quite a challenge to their theology and therefore their popularity because the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, in spirit thing, spiritual things, and angels, any of that stuff. The Pharisees believed in all that, Sadducees did not. Um, so as this threat, they not only sought to kill Jesus, but also to kill Lazarus. I, Charles Spurgeon said it this way, and I, I just liked this quote. 
said, when men hate Christ, they also hate those whom he has blessed and will go to any lengths in seeking to silence their testimony. Mm -hmm. If you don't accept the evidence, you have to get rid of it. <laughs> it's basically what's happening here. And so that's why Jesus said, you know, rejoice when men hate you and persecute you and revile you for my name's sake. Mm -hmm. Rejoice when that happens because that means we are witnessing of him. We are being a light and a testimony for him. And so if they're going to attack him, expect to be in the line of fire. If we're standing with him, you know, don't, don't expect it all to be sunshine, sunshine and roses. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to silence the talk. But the funny thing about this, okay, because they wanted to kill Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. If they succeeded, Jesus could have just raised him from the dead again. <laughs> and they would have had the problem all over again. So it's kind of a little bit ironic that they were seeking to kill him uh, and thought that that would solve the problem. Because uh, we know that that's not exactly how that works, that our God has power. And he has the final say. Uh, but what people will do. Uh, verses 6, uh, not 16, 12 through 16, Sister Ivy. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the, in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, and as it is written, written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him, and that they had done these things to him. So as Jesus enters Jerusalem, there's a large crowd of those coming to the Passover, and they created sort of a parade of sorts. Not an organized parade, of course, but they kind of came together in that, in that sort of way, waving palm branches. Likely, these palm branches were acquired from a nearby city of Jericho, which is literally known as the City of Palms, where they would have date palm trees growing there. It was close by. But palm, drinks, palm branches had come to take on quite a symbolism in, in the culture. Palm, waving palm branches symbolized Judean nationalism, uh, victory, and expectation of the Messiah. We see palm branches, they were being raised in, in some of the Maccabean things um, with that, that revolt and that restoration in Jerusalem, different things, but it was this sense of, of pride in Israel and the Messiah is going to come and put us all together again and, and fix everything. And so this kind of welcome shows the widespread hope that Jesus Maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's the one that's going to come. He's going to deliver us from the Romans. We're going to be free of this oppression. We know all those expectations, of course. And if you look at what they said, they cried out, Hosanna, which is a word of, of course, of praise and rejoicing, but its literal meaning means save now. That's the literal meaning of Hosanna. Save now. Customarily, it would be shouted to welcome a king. Hosanna, Hosanna. It was like welcoming the Acknowledge that the king was going to fight for them, was going to be their salvation in a way. The second part of what they said here, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is almost a direct quote from Psalms 118 verse 26, which is one of the halal or one of the praise songs that was frequently sung during Passover. And then, of course, the third part of it, the king of Israel, it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> You can't get any clearer than that, that they were welcoming Jesus in as a, as, a, as a leader, as a political or military Messiah. So their hopes and intentions were on full display. And this is the only public demonstration that Jesus allowed of this sort. And it really, it seemed to force, force the Pharisees' hands. We'll see their reaction to it in the next, in the next few verses. So up to this time, you know, the hour was not yet. He was kind of holding back from any, if they tried to get too rowdy and try to crown him, he, he stepped back. This time he allowed it to happen because things are, are leading up to that last week. But he rode in on a donkey, which is in fulfillment of Zechariah 9 and verse 9. And uh, we've mentioned this before in other Gospels, but it symbolizes peace and humility, not coming in as a conquering warrior. They didn't understand these things at first, of course, but afterwards, looking back, the power of hindsight, they put the pieces together, they understood 
understood the, the prophecy being fulfilled there. Verses 17 through 19. Sister Lucy. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail, nothing? Behold, the world is gone after them. Mm -hmm. So as the people who witnessed Lazarus being raised from the dead, they continue to share and talk about what they had seen, and the crowd continues to grow because of that. And again, that expectation is growing. Okay, if, if he can raise the dead, then he can liberate Israel. He can be the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one. And so in all this happening, we see the defeated attitude of the Pharisees, that they're starting to realize this is getting out of control. We are losing this battle. And in fact, they're literally saying, you see, you're, you're accomplishing nothing. They're telling each other, you're, you're not accomplishing anything. I like it when the enemy says that. <laughs> I like it when, when uh, you know, the, our enemy, the devil, can say, I'm not accomplishing anything. <laughs> I've been trying. I've been trying to, to kick them down and to stop what's happening. I'm not, I'm not making any headway. I like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I really do. Um, so they, they say this, you know, the whole world, the world has gone after him. They may be exaggerating a little bit, but as we see in the next few verses, we see the Gentiles coming uh, to him. So their statement is uh, unintentionally, perhaps, but it is prophetic in nature. Indeed, the whole world. And now, of course, we can look back and we can see how the message of Jesus Christ has spread like wildfire throughout history and how many, you know, know his name now and know what he has done and Yep, yep, oh yeah, they were telling the truth. The whole world has gone after him. Verses 20 through 26, Sister Play. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of the Seda of Galilee, and beside him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. And But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Yeah, through to 26. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these Greeks that come to, to Philip, first of all, they were most likely Gentile God-fearers. And there's actually quite a few of these. We see Cornelius is a good example of, of one that we may know of. Uh, they weren't proselytites. They had it converted to Judaism, but yet they would come up and they would worship in the Gentile court of the temple. So they recognized Jehovah as their God, but were not officially converted to Judaism. And so uh, we see them, they're coming up to worship at the feast, and the language is such that they habitually came to worship at the feast. And they want, they have a desire to meet with Jesus, whether a curiosity, whether they heard about the miracles, you know, we don't know particularly the reason, but they wished to see Jesus, they wanted to meet with Jesus, so they came to Philip. Philip was from Bethsaida, which it tells us that, um, uh, it tells us here that he was from Bethsaida, and so perhaps there was some connection there, because it specifically mentions that, and Philip is also a Greek name, so maybe it was just a He's the most likely candidate. I don't know. Uh, and then Philip goes to Andrew. <laughs> That's kind of a, a, a tag along here. But Philip goes to Andrew, and then uh, from there, every time we find Andrew, this is interesting. If you study into Andrew, every single time he appears, almost always, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. From the phone, first moment when uh, God called him, and he went, and he, he got to Peter, I believe it was, um, to the... The little boy who had the loaves and fishes, he brought him to Jesus. Every time we see Andrew, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. That's a good, that's about all we know about him, but that's a pretty good testimony to have. 
And so Philip informs Andrew, should we bring them to Jesus? And they told Jesus about it, so I think they, that, that's the answer. We don't know necessarily the outcome of that conversation, uh, whether Jesus met with them or not. But the arrival of the Gentiles seeking Jesus marked a turning point. Up to this point, Jesus was saying, the hour's not yet, the hour's not yet, the hour's not yet. Now he says, the hour has come. Now is the time that the Son of Man should be glorified. But the glorification of the Son of God, the Son of Man, would happen through suffering and death. And here we find a very true principle, and Jesus elaborates on a little bit. Except for a corn of, of wheat, or except, except a seed fall in the ground and die, it can't produce anything. A seed won't become a plant. It won't bear fruit. It won't multiply until it first is, is buried, dies, and is buried in the ground. There's no glory without suffering first. There's no life without death. There's no victory without surrender. And Jesus set the example for this. His glorification meant that there had to be a humiliation first. And he took that on himself. He set that example. And if it, Jesus had to do it, how much more so us? He's paid the price. He's died. But we must follow that example. We, if we want to serve him, we must follow him. A seed is useless. And it's significant until it is planted. And in the same way, only when we are completely, 100% yield yielded and surrendered to the Lord can we really accomplish or achieve our purpose in life. Yes. Or even understand our purpose. But once a seed is planted, once it's, you know, metaphorically speaking, given up its free will and, and been planted in the ground and, and it's it's died to itself and is buried, then it can become fruitful. And then the reward comes as a result of that. So we must follow Jesus to the cross. Of course, not literally, but we must follow in his footsteps of dying to ourselves and surrendering all to the Lord. Uh, verse 27 through 33, Sister Kathy. Now So, Jesus was troubled. So his soul was troubled. And of course, how could it not be? As he's approaching and it's coming nearer and nearer the hour of his death, he, he knows what he's going to go through. He knows the pain that he's going to endure. Yet we find here, it doesn't, John doesn't record the Garden of Gethsemane prayer as we know it. You know, Father, not, not my will, but thine be done. But this is basically the, the equivalent of that in John's Gospel. He doesn't pray to escape it. He doesn't ask to be saved from the suffering to come. He understood the purpose of it, but it's, it's phrased almost as a prayer that Jesus considers but refuses to pray. What, should I say this? I, I could say this. I could say, Father, save me from this hour. Sh should I say that? You know, that kind of question. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So I, I could ask to be released from this. I could ask to be saved and spared from this. But I, no, I surrender. It's, it's the same thing as saying, Father, not my will, but thine be done. He surrenders his will for the glory of the Father. And that is a lesson we must always apply to our prayers. Because it's common for us to want to pray, Lord, get me out of this situation. Fix it. <laughs> Fix it, Lord. Provide for me. Fit, you know, make this happen, etc., etc. But 
what if his name is glorified not in the immediate fixing of our situation, but in our character being developed through it, or in, in something else that will happen as a result of us going through the, the process yes. Yes. and the suffering. Father, glorify your name. Yes. Glorify your name. Whatever brings you glory mm -hmm. in my life, do that. As a result of, of what he says and, and this prayer, a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. This is the third time in Jesus' earthly life that this happened, that a voice came from heaven and, and people around it heard. The first one was at his baptism. The second one was at his transfiguration, where just Peter, James, and John saw him uh, with Moses and Elijah and, and his face glowing. And then now, just as he's preparing to, to go into his death. But each time that the voice spoke, it was not a confirmation for himself. It was not for his benefit. Mm -hmm. It was for the people to have this audible confirmation of who Jesus was and that he was God sent. The time had come for Satan to be defeated and the spirit of this world to be judged. Jesus would be lifted up on the cross. This uh, saying where he says, if I am lifted up from the earth. It has a double meaning there as well, but both of them were clearly understood. This was not one of Jesus' kind of obscure sayings where people had no idea what he was talking about. It was a clear expression that was used to refer to crucifixion. They, they knew what he was talking about. So the primary meaning, meaning of this, to be lifted up, is to be elevated upon a cross, as in crucifixion. And the secondary meaning of it is to be exalted in triumph, which is a wonderful play on words here because we understand that both of those happened at Calvary. He was lifted up, he was crucified, he was humiliated, he suffered and he died. But in that was an exaltation. In that was a triumph over death, hell, and the grave. In that was payment and freedom from sin for all who would follow him. So at Calvary, both of those things would occur. He would be lifted up and draw all people to himself. Everyone would have an opportunity because of what he did at Calvary. And we can say it this way, the cross is the magnet of Christianity. It is what draws people. At least it should be. If people are drawn by the cross, then they'll stay at the foot of the cross. If they're drawn by anything else, whether it be talent or, or methods or any of those things, which Use them all, praise God. Use them all for the glory of God. But if we ever lose the cross being the central element, if we ever lose the focus on what Jesus did for us, we've lost it. And it's not something that we even want to draw people to. Because it's all about the cross. It's all about what he did for us. Otherwise, we can't even, we can't even be here. We can't even have a hope of heaven but because of what he did. Let's read verses 34 through 36. I think Brother Pelay, I think. The people answered him, We have heard of, of the Lord that Christ divided forever. And now says thou, The Son of Man must be lifted up. Who is the Son of Man? And Jesus said unto, Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is a light with you. Walk while ye have the light. Lest darkness come upon you. For that he that walketh in darkness knows not whether he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of the light. These things spake Jesus and departed, and did hide himself from them. Mm -hmm. So the people had this understanding, this idea that the Messiah would live forever. They weren't wrong, but there was maybe just some omissions in that understanding. And so this talk of dying and being lifted up on a cross was incongruent with, with that idea. The Messiah is going to live forever. How are you talking about being the Son of Man yet going and dying on a cross? There was a lot of confusion about this. And most likely the common people were taught most of the, the triumphal Messiah passages. Where he was going to ride in and with victory and all of those things. Um, and not so much on the suffering servant passages as relating to the Messiah. 
And that's why even us, I mean, we need the whole counsel of scripture. It's very dangerous to only hear select parts and you can go crazy and, and get off on, you know, crazy territory, but you need the whole, the whole picture. But, of course, we understand that Jesus is immortal in his glorified body. But he was only to be with them in the flesh for a short time. Only three years or so total, which if you think about it, we know how fast time flies. That's no time at all. Three and a half years, that's, that's really nothing. And now he's looking at the point where he only has a week left before his crucifixion. Time is short. And so he was urging them to take the opportunity to believe and walk in the light while it was present, to accept him while he was there. But let's see their response, verses 37 uh, through 43. We'll hurry through the last, last bits of it. Uh, Brother Dylan, over to you. All right. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of, of, of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord both been revealed. Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said, again, he hath blinded their eyes, hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things Isaiah, when he saw his glory, and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believe on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So, in the last parts of these chapters, uh, from 37 onwards, there's a key word here, and it is the word believe. It is used eight times. In, in this passage here. So there were still those, in spite of the signs that Jesus had worked, raising, raising Lazarus from the dead, etc., there were still those that refused to believe. And John here quotes first from Isaiah 53 and 1, and then Isaiah 6 and verse 10. If someone does believe on Jesus, it is because God has revealed himself and revealed truth to them. But of course, there were so many that refused to accept the truth right in front of them. Right. And they would be blinded with unbelief. It's kind of a, a maybe a weird concept sometimes to wrap our heads around. Uh, but a good example of this is Pharaoh, when sometimes it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then other times it says that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, well, did Pharaoh have a say in it then if God's hardening his heart? And uh, I guess one way you could describe this is, and that I've seen it described, is judicial blindness, meaning that as a result of their rejection or unbelief, it's like God blinds, like puts a, a shutter over their eyes kind of thing. But it's because of their initial action or decision. So in other words, God strengthens or reinforces whatever decision they choose to make. Okay, if they're going to harden their heart, let it be hardened. If they're going to soften their heart and, and obey me, let it be softened, sort of thing. Because, again, we know what God feels about lukewarmness. <laughs> Said, are you, were you, words you were either cold nor hot. Pick one. Don't, don't straddle the fence. Commit to whatever you're going you're gonna to decide. Verse 41 is interesting because it correlates Isaiah's vision of God and his glory, which if you read in... Um, Isaiah talks about, you know, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he talks about his train filling the temple, the doorpost shaking, everything. He has this magnificent vision of the glory of God. And so this is brought out here. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. But that him there, because of the contest, is being applied to Jesus Christ. The glory that Isaiah saw of God, you know, if you could read about what Isaiah saw. He, it is applied here to the manifestation of Jesus, who was God in flesh. We beheld his glory, the only begotten son. The glory of God made visible. Anyway, many did not believe, but even of the, the rulers and the Sanhedrin, the religious court, um, there was there's some pretty high ups that believed. But a lot of them stayed undercover. So if they were on the Sanhedrin, if they were a Pharisee or a Sadducee or, or whatever, or a priest, they tended to stay undercover because there was a lot of opposition. And in those, fine for the common people. They can do what they want. Mm -hmm. But 
they would be, if someone in, in that kind of circles said that they had believed in Jesus, they would have been excommunicated, they would have lost their position, their power, their influence, um, their money, source of income, etc. Some examples of this, although they did come out publicly later on, Nicodemus, we know Nicodemus came secretly at night. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea was another one. Now, after Jesus died, we see them involved in the burial. So that was obviously somewhat public. But there were priests and Pharisees who basically, they wanted the best of both worlds. They believed in him, they believed in his message, but weren't quite ready to give up what they had. They weren't quite ready to bow at his feet like Mary and make a fool of themselves to, the, to their peers. They weren't quite ready to fall and die and be buried like the seed and, and give it all. They weren't quite ready to go that far or to worship with the palm branches with everybody else, but they believed. Pride is the biggest hindrance to people from coming to the Lord, especially those that are rich, those that are good. I'm a good person. To the religious, pride is the biggest hindrance because it revolves a humbling of themselves and saying, you know what, I'm wrong. I don't have it all. That can be really hard to do. These people that's talking about here, they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. They cared more about what people thought about them than what the Lord thought about them. And that is an easy trap and a very dangerous trap for us to fall into. To care about more what other people think. Because other people, they're right in front of us, right? We can see the look on their face when they're judging us. We can hear their, their criticism when they say it. But really, it is so much more important what Jesus thinks about us. And sometimes we get that perspective all skewed. But it's not going to matter what somebody else thought of the decisions you made. When you're standing in front of Jesus, it's not going to matter one little bit. Don't hold back from making a decision for him because of what somebody else might think. Oh, Lord, help us. Verses 44 to 50. Sister Monroe, let's finish off with me. For they loved the praise of men. Sorry, um, wrong one. <laughs> Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come to... I am come a light unto the world. What, what whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejoiceth me and rejoiceth not my words hath one that judges him, judgeth him. The world that I have spoken the words I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. So very quickly, these are Jesus' last words to the public in the entire Gospel of John. From this point forward, anything that he says is to a private group, his disciples, etc. This is his last public address. And it's a final call for them to believe. It's like an appeal of sorts, just the altar call kind of. And it, it almost summarizes his teaching of what he said so far. But it's a call to make a decision. Accept it or reject it. The central intention of the incarnation was not judgment, but salvation. Because he didn't have to come to earth to judge. He didn't need to add humanity to judge. He could do that just fine as God alone. But he came in flesh to seek and to save the lost. However, just because his purpose in coming was salvation, every, it doesn't mean that there was not judgment. Every word that he spoke would judge those that rejected those words. People will stand before him. And it'll be his words that he's already spoken, he's already given. There won't need to be anything new spoken, any new laws given, etc. Mm -hmm. It'll be what he's already said if it is rejected. 
So there's a warning there to those that reject, but to those that obey them, they will walk in light and have everlasting life. Let's stand and let's pray, and then if there's any questions, we can take them, but I'm aware of being over time. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word today, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for what we see in your word, the example of Mary and her worship. God, let us worship like that, like those that worshiped you as you came into Jerusalem, Lord. Let us cry to you, holy God, cry Hosanna before you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would help us to yield and surrender. We surrender everything to you, oh God. We want to follow you, Lord, even if it takes us to the cross, oh God. Let us be willing to go to the cross, Lord. And then glorification or exaltation comes after. Lord, let us surrender and yield everything to you, Jesus. Not being worried about what people might be saying or people might be thinking about us. God, help us to lay aside our pride, lay aside our self-will. Lord, just as you did, Lord, and say, Father, glorify your name, Jesus. It's what you think, God. It's what you glorifies you that matters above absolutely everything else. Lord, glorify your name in each one of us this week, I pray. Go with us. Lord, let us walk in the light everywhere that we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Any questions? All right. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.